I'd like to introduce our first set of speakers, um, Athar Mufre and Gabrielle Kruller of the Brooklyn-based firm Cadaster. Athar received her B.Arch from Birzeit University in the West Bank of Palestine and a Master's in Integrated Urbanism and Sustainable Design from Stuttgart University. Gabrielle received a B.Arch from Carnegie Mellon and an Advanced Master of Architecture degree from the Berlaga Institute. In 2017, Cadaster won the Rethinking Our Rivers International Urban Planning Competition, Quebec City, and in 2016, the first prize in the Twin Creeks Linear Park Design Competition in Kansas City. The jury noted that their design approach was rooted in deep research, appreciating the clarity of how Cadaster approached questions of land, of what sits under architecture, and the politics of what underwrites architecture or as described by the firm in an excerpt from their portfolio text, architecture exists objectively inasmuch as it is connected physically, legally, politically, socially, economically, ecologically, conceptually, geographically, historically to a surrounding context. Without this situating network, it is peripheral to reality. This objective of practicing architecture is to take on this mess, to trigger, tune, and transpose the web of relations that give meaning to space and physical condition. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, everyone who is here. It's great to see you. Uh, it's very much an honor for us to be here, and we're grateful to the Architecture League uh, for this opportunity and the Parsons School of Design for hosting us here. Uh, it's a pleasure to share our ideas with you, and we're looking forward to the following presentations as well. Um, our firm is Cadaster. I'm Gabriel and, and Athar. Our work together over the past few years has been focused specifically on what we call the architecture of urban conditions. What we mean by the architecture of urban conditions is not necessarily a large scale, the, the scale of a city or the scale of a region, but more precisely, our, the architecture of urban conditions is a field of forces, of institutions and customs that pervasively and precisely are shaping the surface of the earth. For short, we call this territory. As architects, our office is concerned with how territories, how these urban conditions are formed, how they're maintained, and how they could be made vulnerable to change through architectural intervention and architectural knowledge. As such, we have been focusing our projects and our efforts on these public territorial extents. These forces, institutions, and customs that make up the, the environment eventually and often necessarily um, take some material, spatial, or legal form, um, often in, in territorial features which you may be familiar with, real property, rights of way, jurisdictional boundaries, forms of ownership, property values, zoning ordinances, economic protocols, remote environmental impacts, etc. And these elements are also not only the territorial features that, that we observe, but they're also the leverages of intervention. These are the features whose dynamics and, and characteristics can be altered through intervention. Uh, working on urban conditions means taking on these issues uh, directly and also their political implications and not accepting them as givens. Uh, as, as our understanding uh, of the built environment, um, it consists not just of buildings but, and the space outside of buildings, but of uh, the relationship between the elements of the territory. And um, we see buildings as uh, one element of this territory, but in fact it is one focus of our architecture practice. Um, it is, in fact, uh, primarily the relationship between those territorial elements that form and uh, kind of um, define our belt environment. Um, given uh, our current landscape of professions and specializations between architecture and urban planning, um, or planning per se, uh, uh, we think that um, that there is uh, this gray zone, uh, the responsibility on, on working on the territory is kind of vague and it's hard uh, and it's very difficult to pin down. Um, because there is um, this uh, predominance of, of the market. Um, and uh, because of that, the result is the fact that the foundation of the environment 
particularly in, in places that are uh, dominated by the market, like the US, um, we think is managed by uh, figures and uh, entities that are operating on, on the basis of uh, land commodification or the commodification of space. Um, for instance, uh, the most uh, close example is real estate developers. We think that they are actually the leaders of the transformation in our belt environment. They are, um, it is their uh, kind of market visions that, um, that are codified in the parameters of performers uh, become the, the constituent. The const constraint frame of action for architecture and urban, urban design. So with these actors, uh, and besides uh, a bag of weak and strong uh, governmental land policies, the environment is, is, uh, is primarily, uh, they actually um, transform the environment, uh, although uh, in a problematic way, um, and they create these um, visions of urban space and society. So working under these conditions, um, perhaps we should ask ourselves uh, to what extent is the environment and, and our profession as architect as architects is, is predetermined or even predesigned by the system. And um, if space is first and foremost is, is kind of a parameter of, of um, finance and um, uh, to what impact do our interventions um, kind of go? Um, architecture, therefore, cannot be this objectified, objectified a product of a professional, but it is this network of relations that move the matter around us. In the exhibition in the, in the gallery next door, uh, we're showing three of the territorial features that we have been working on. Land parcels, rights of way, and watersheds. Land parcels, uh, with a map of which is shown here, are the product of land division and land ownership. And legally, this is known as real property, a specific type of property. The institution of real property has an infinite horizon. And this you can see in the, in the way that every land is, is, is accounted for. Every land has some owner. Um, it's the common denominator in all territories across the entire world. And this geography of land parcels is documented in a particular type of map that's called a cadaster. And our interest in cadasters stem from the fact that the institution of real property is such a fundamental feature of territory. Because real property is a kind of infrastructure that, that very much uh, determines the forms and the dynamics um, of the built environment and even buildings. So cadastres are also uh, an evidence of the political ideology that a particular piece of land could be made exclusive, owned by a single person. On the urban frontier of Houston, however, we found a very special case where this uniformity of the property landscape was ruptured. In the sea of master plan subdivisions, there is a plot held by a church that was not purchased, nor is it rented. The possessors of the parcel, St. John Missionary Baptist Church, which was founded by an Afro-American uh, Baptist congregation in 1869, um, asserts their land claim through practice. Because according to the land deed that they have, they can use the land as long as they are maintaining their church surfaces. And if those ever cease, the land is forfeited. So this is the case of land being held not indefinitely by somebody who purchased it, but by a community who is practicing continuously. The church, uh, in fact, is in company of thousands of other churches uh, across the South, um, uh, a map of which is shown here. We collectively call these the Freedmen Churches, uh, which were built by former slaves um, on the sugarcane, former sugarcane and cotton plantations across the South in the wake of abolition. And many of them actually have the same land deed restrictions, uh, if you see it as a restriction, as, as St. John. We started this project in 2012 uh, when we approached the congregation of St. John uh, when we were curious to learn about their building, because they had just uh, survived an arson that burned down half the, half the building. Um, and working with the church in that, since that time has been very rewarding, 
um, and challenging. The, the historic building is in, is in very poor condition, and the church has had a decrease in membership over the past decades. Most notably also is that the rural, formerly rural context around the church is now completely uh, developed by master plan subdivisions. So the question is, how do these formerly rural churches now survive and prosper in this new context? And what could we learn as architects from the idea that, that, that they have, the politics they have of land holding, that land holding is something that's practiced, not purchased? Together with the congregation, you can see here the, the kind of work that we did together with them in the field to, to come up with the idea. Our objective was to develop a project that would um, help the church assert their land claim. As such, the project, which is ongoing, uh, works primarily on the design of the site more than the building, emphasizing and tuning the surface of the property in, as a way to promote engagement with the broader uh, surroundings. One of the major features is a large field, the grounds of which uh, are the, the, for the church's annual homecoming event. Uh, the building, we suggested to, to shift slightly closer to the street so that its large front porch uh, would open up to the sidewalk. And perhaps the, the, the most significant feature that, that we worked on and discussed with them um, was actually uh, following the square perimeter of the parcel. Uh, we planned a trail, a sidewalk, a path, which is highlighting this property boundary, but not with a fence or a wall, which is normally done in this area to demarcate the property, but uh, with an element of urban continuity, thereby offering the neighborhood access to this uh, very special extra territory. The plan, however, has faced difficulties, and most recently, a few months ago, the church decided that they want to demolish the building, and they are now looking for uh, funds to construct a new one. And many of the other churches in this area uh, face a wide variety of threats, and uh, we continue to work with them. So beside, uh, beside parcels or real property, another element of the territory which we have been working on is the watershed. The watersheds are these natural um, kind of um, rooms, hydrological rooms that are shaped by ge the geography of a place and uh, the flow of water as well. Um, so these watersheds are important, not just for the quality, the environmental quality, but for um, structuring the urban area around them. And uh, in a project uh, north of Kansas City, uh, which we um, uh, uh, did um, uh, uh, last year, uh, the water we used the watershed as a, um, as a structure to um, to help the develop uh, construct the, the new development in the area. So um, this pay, this project was a unique opportunity um, because uh, it was held by the the, the municipality. Um, the municipality uh, thought that there, there is a, a threat. Um, ongoing by the by the creeping kind of uh, suburban development in the area, and they wanted to have a, a better urban vision. So they held a competition, and we participated in that competition. And uh, this area, which is north of Kansas City, called Twin Creeks, uh, because of uh, the density of urban uh, stream or water streams that uh, run through the area, and um, uh, it is kind of quickly being converted into this suburban single-family housing um, place. So um, uh, what we did is that we analyzed this layer of the watershed, and then uh, we kind of created a, a system of trails. Uh, as you can see here, the, the trails are um, uh, following the crisp line of the watersheds, and there are three paths, the three kinds of paths. Um, their function is, is not only to provide connectivity in the area, but in fact they are um, primarily uh, to preempt the, the development uh, or the future development in, in, in this uh, particular uh, area. 
So this project works with the fact that the watershed is a space, is a space that is actually pre-designed by the geography. The proposed uh, trail network is a straightforward gesture that can be implemented by the planning department. And uh, it is also uh, a, a recreation and mobility uh, place, or it, it is a multifunction, uh, uh, it has a multifunction um, purpose, and most importantly, it is an organized and urban structure over time. Uh, on, a third, uh, on a third point, uh, the third element of the territory that we have been working on is uh, the rights of way, or simply the streets. So historically, the rights of way is the right for someone to pass through uh, others' private property uh, along a specific path. And um, transportation nowadays, uh, or the transportation infrastructure, is, is probably the, uh, one of the most dominant um, structures in our urban conditions. Uh, perhaps in, in most cases, or in many cases, it, the street network is very redundant. And in a project for Quebec City, uh, also uh, which was uh, done through a, a competition that the municipality also conducted, um, we uh, we uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, focused on on the not not just the. Uh, not just a specific element of the uh, competition. The competition was focused on rethinking the rivers of the city. So the focus was on developing the waterways, but in fact, we did not just uh, want to develop the waterways. We wanted to uh, provide a comprehensive um, uh, a project for the whole territory. And um, Quebec City, as you may know, has a very uh, historic center and it is a UNESCO World uh, Heritage Site. But just outside of the city walls, it is a completely different place. The sprawling metropolitan area has one of the highest uh, er, um, value of uh, road kilometers per capita in North America. And the street is primarily focused uh, or centered around its highways. And our observation uh, was that the proliferation of private residential properties and a redundant road network created the conditions in which actually the waterways became uh, virtually disconnected from their surroundings. So in, in this case, we also looked at the urban history or uh, the colonial history of the place, and we specifically looked at the um, property system from the French era. And uh, uh, particularly this system is called the long lot. As you can see here, they are like those thin long parcels that are organized in an array along the rivers. And in the past, they provided access to the rivers, which were uh, the primary structure in, in the city. And um, nowadays, um, uh, there is this, this kind of um, shift that the city kind of um, shifted its center uh, from the rivers, and they are just backwards. Um, they are in the back, in, disconnected. And uh, with these issues in mind, we saw that the opportunity to, re to refocus the urban hierarchy and improve the water quality and provide new forms of access and civic space. Uh, using a GIS or geoprocessing tools to analyze the street network, we uh, found that many of these roads are redundant and they could be removed without uh, making any um, influence on the traffic flow, shown in the dashed line as you see here. Um, so we therefore came with the idea that uh, by reintroducing the, the long lot uh, as a territorial protocol in the city, um, uh, which you see in, in black lines ac across the rivers. This is um, what we call the headwater lot. 
um, these are um, to these are a way to retrofit the city with a network of prominent multi-purpose spaces. They are not uh, used to link only the the, the river with the neighborhoods. Um, but they are also um, used uh, as a multi-functional place for recreation, cultivation, and other things. Um, so, in fact, um, we saw this a very good option for the municipality, and it was um, a, a, an easy proposal kind of to to start implementing um, because uh, the streets are already there, they are uh, public property. The, the municipality could just uh, repurpose them and without having to um, expropriate private property uh, on the river, they can make a huge transformation on a large scale. For the exhibition, uh, we wanted we sought to document these features, the properties, the rights of way in the watershed, and um, we considered what kind of document we could use to emphasize those urban conditions uh, that we were dealing with. And one of the references that, that we found were these uh, USGS maps, United States Geological, Geological Survey maps, um, produced by the government, the US government, since the uh, late 1800s. These are large-scale surveys of the US territory. And what's interesting about them is how they they show these pervasive territorial features that are typically outside of the frame of, of architectural practice. So in the gallery, we, you will see a series of maps. Each of them was produced using a pen plotter. And uh, three of them are documenting uh, the territorial conflict that each of the projects address. And another three are projecting our design proposals as if they were to appear on a USGS map um, also adopting the kind of symbols and the annotations that are used in those maps um, to give a kind of apparent objective measure. Our belief is that architecture needs a reality. It needs some kind of situating network. And our objective in practicing architecture is, is precisely this, to take on that mess, to take on the mess of reality, to trigger um, and work with this web of relations that is ultimately shaping the built environment. So our objective um, is, is about taking a position, a political position, in relation to a given context, and then determining what, given that position, architecture can do there. Thank you.